morning. In Christ's name, I, I welcome you to worship. I know you guys, the, the, there's so much energy in this room sometimes. Choir. Um, let's uh, take a moment to be present to this chance to worship together, to be aware of God's presence here in this place and uh, open our hearts and minds to what God might speak to us today. So take a couple of deep breaths and uh, we'll begin the call to worship in a moment. gather here today to more closely follow Jesus, who is the way and the truth and the life for us. And we remember his new commandment that we love one another as he has loved us, that others might know that we are Christ's disciples. So let us worship God. Let us open our hearts and minds to what God would speak to us today. I'd ask that you stand with me if, as you're able for the call to worship. Praise God, all people. Praise the Lord, all creation. Whales doing backflips in the air, squid and octopi dancing on the ocean floor. Mountains rising to greet the sunrise, gophers tunneling through our front lawns. Children sitting at our table, grandparents the hills. Vineyards decorating our valley, weeds growing fast in our ch growing faster than our children. Praise God, all Praise the Lord, all creation. Let us join together in singing the opening hymn.
In Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul writes that he is convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us offer our prayers of confession, trusting in God's love for us. Shall we pray, seeking God's healing and strength, let us pray first in silence and then together. And now together, Creator God, we confess. we confess the world we live in is not intended for us. You crafted a beautiful earth full of life. We created a world of wealth and power, stripping your earth of its bountiful resources. You created us all and called us good. We built walls and ways of dividing others by race and gender, sexual orientation, and politics and economics. You called us to be fruitful and multiply, but did not call us to restrict and judge others. Call all into accountability when we have failed to seek you and instead have sought power and dominance. Call us We are created in God's image. We are beloved by God. Christ laid down his life for all of us. And in Christ, we have new life. We're forgiven. Let us live believing this good news that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. for hearing and heeding the movement of the Holy Spirit in the gospel read, preached, and sung. Let us open our hearts and minds as we listen for the Spirit's leading. Shall we pray? Holy God, the tomb has been opened, and we would dance into your future. Your life has dawned on us, and we are grateful. Breathe peace into our souls so we may bring healing to a troubled world. Show us how we may give love to others. Send us out to serve others. Fill us with hope so we may live in your joy. Show us your way, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Psalm 148 is a song of praise from all of creation to God. 
God is above all, creator of all, and is the advocate for the people. The psalmist concludes by praising the faithful, the people of Israel closest to God, and all praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise God in the heights. Praise God and all God's angels. Praise the Lord and all heavenly hosts. Praise God, sun and moon. Praise God, all you shining stars. Praise God, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For God commanded and they were created. God established them forever and ever and fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth. You sea monsters in all deeps, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind fulfilling God's command. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, kings and queens of the earth and all peoples and all rulers of the earth. Young men and women alike, old and young, together, let them praise the name of the Lord, for God's name alone is exalted. God's glory is above earth and heaven. The Lord has raised up a horn for the people. Praise for all the faithful, for the people of Israel and who are close to God. Praise the Lord. The first reading for this morning. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Finn. How are you? You stole my seat, but that's okay. I have a new picture for you today, okay? So I'm going to put these in here when you're ready for it. Can you see what that is? Who does that look like? Anybody here? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, last week we talked about um, the place where we read scripture. So I'm going to ask you to walk up here with me again. First, we're going to talk to the choir for a minute, okay? Can you and Grandma come with me? <clears throat> okay. We're going to come over here. We've already talked about the choir. Um, but do you notice anything different about them than everybody else in the church? They're all wearing the same color, and they're wearing a special garment. It's red. It's called a robe. It's called a robe. And then they have a white thing around their necks, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So I wonder why they do that. But there's somebody else who dresses like that as well. So let's come over and talk to him for a minute. <laughs> Would you mind standing up, Pastor? <laughs> Finn, you know who this is, right? You know this person? This Pastor Jonathan? That's right. And look what he's wearing. It's not red, but it's a robe, just like the choir. And then he's wearing this around his neck. And the reason he wears a robe, and the reason choir wears a robe, is they're, they're um, speaking, their clothes speak of their calling to ministry. And it also takes us away from looking at what color shirt someone is wearing or their happy um, flowered pants or whatever it might be. We're seeing them. Oh, no. Okay. We're seeing them as ministers of God. And the other part of that is there to keep them themselves inside so that we're not a 
yeah, looking at clothing or something else about them. Now this right here and what the choir is wearing that is all white, we call a stole, okay? And we wear that too as a symbol of our calling and to show that we belong to Jesus, those who are called to ministry. And that is what we look like when we preach from the pulpit and we read scripture. They're looking at the baptismal font. We'll get to that next week. Okay. All right. Let, let's have a little prayer together. God, we know that each of us is called to serve you. We thank you for those in leadership in this congregation who wear the robe, who wear the stole, not really setting them apart from us, but reminding us that they have been called to these particular ministries. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, choir. If you'd warned me, I would have worn my flowered pants, but... <laughs> In Acts 11, uh, Peter is being questioned by some of the other early Christian leaders for he had been eating with Gentiles. And Peter recalls how a, an angel had sent him to a centurion's home and that the Holy Spirit had come down upon them as he spoke to this man and his household. And they were baptized. So now listen for what God speaks to our hearts in this passage as Peter explains his calling. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? And then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. And the, there was this, something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. <clears throat> and as I looked, as I looked closely, I saw four-footed animals beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. And I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, By no means. Lord, nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. And then this happened three times, and then everything was pulled up again into heaven. And at that very moment, three men sent from, to me from uh, Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. And the Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house and he told us how he had been seeing an angel standing in his house and saying send to Joppa and bring Simon who is called Peter and he will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved and as I began to speak the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as it had upon me, us, at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord and how he had said to John, baptize you with water, but I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? And when they heard this, they were silenced. 
And they praise God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. This ends the readings for today. May God bless them to our understanding and deepen our faith through them. And to God be all praise and glory now and forever. Amen. So this morning, I think we should start with sea monsters. I mean, why not? Sea monsters, really, in the scriptures. In Psalm 148, there's a song of praise, an encyclopedia, basically, of the natural world. And the obvious point is that everything created, everything in the universe, should sing praises to God who made them. Praise God, sun and moon. Praise God, all you shining stars. Praise God, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind, fulfilling God's commands. Mountains and hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and cattle, creeping things and flying birds. I mean, before you know it, we zip through 10 verses and each one of them jam packed with creatures, all before we hear anything about human beings. Verse 11 kings and queens of the earth, all peoples, all the rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. To me, it's, it's really poetry, right? It's, it's beautiful. And it's easy to let the words flow from you without thinking about how radically egalitarian all of this is. What distinction is there really between a king and an earthworm here? When standing before the God of the universe... What's their, where's the distinctions? Each thing should feel a hum, the humble nature of their gifted lives. Each should sing a song of praise. This is poetry. It is politics. It's theology. And it's powerful. Which brings me to sea monsters. The scriptures are sprinkled with references to a frightening creature known as Leviathan in the Bible. It appears in the Psalms, in Isaiah, in Amos, and Job. And Job's reference may be the most notable because it's believed that Job is the oldest book in all of scripture, older even than Genesis. And I like to think that this sea monster, as old as images there is in scripture, just is sort of lurking in the deepest, darkest waters of our imaginations, surfacing from time to time to scare the living daylights out of us. The Leviathan is almost always represented as an enemy, a threat. Behold, the hope of him is in vain, writes Job. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of Leviathan? Prophet Isaiah uses Leviathan as a metaphor for Babylon, the literal and monstrous oppressor of the people of Israel. And all of the context makes the sea monsters included in Psalm 148 rather shocking. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps. And the implication is clear. Even the monsters are included in God's landscape of love. Even the monsters have a song to sing, a song of praise. Praise the Lord. So I think this cosmic context, context is a helpful point of reference for uh, the much more relatable squabble that we hear about in Acts 11. Peter finds himself on the spot. 
answering to a crowd of Jesus followers who are upset to discover that uh, their de facto leader has been eating with Roman centurion and his friends. They are evidently unaware of the irony of the situation, uh, given the fact that Jesus was constantly being criticized for sharing a table with disreputable people. But before Peter even arrived in Judea, his Jewish friends had already heard through the grapevine that Gentiles had also accepted the word of God, including a soldier named Cornelius, whom Peter refers to in this story. And you'd think that they'd be delighted, right? As Jesus explicitly had asked them to share this, his story all around the world, to the ends of the earth. But no, they're upset. You might think that the principal objection here would be that the Gentile converts are not of Israeli descent. It was, after all, only a few chapters earlier that Peter spoke of the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors. I mean, how many generations, how many centuries have uh, we thought an important feature of our identity, Jewish identity or whatever our ethnic heritage might be, was who we were? But these Judeans are not particularly worried about genealogy. They're far more upset about circumcision and unclean food. Seriously? As it happens, there are an awful lot of laws in the Torah about clean and unclean food. In Leviticus 11, God instructs Moses to inform the people that they there are many foods that they may not eat, foods that they can eat. So any animals with cleft hooves, any animals that uh, chew their cud are not to be eaten. Specific animals named include camels, uh, rock badgers. Okay, we have no trouble with those, right? <laughs> but then it gets to rabbits. Birds of the air, pigs, I mean, who doesn't like their bacon? Come on. <laughs> of their flesh, it says in Leviticus, you shall not eat, for they are unclean for you. And at stake here is cleanliness, which is another way of saying their purity. Purity was a prerequisite in their minds for approaching God for having a relationship with God. If you were unclean, you were unable to approach the, or enter the sanctuary. So the stakes were pretty high. Uh, why would you associate with people who might render you unholy and unapproachable? And over time, this theological conviction developed into a revulsion for certain foods. I really wish they'd included beets in that. I'd be in better shape. Anyway, the, the revulsion produced this, this strong physical response that conti continued to maintain divisions of us, the clean ones, and them, those who are dirty. Lewis Mudge notes that the culture is almost always more powerful than theology. This is a variation on uh, management guru Peter Drucker's famous statement, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Strategies to transform your business are guaranteed to fail if your culture has not evolved as well. So it's far easier uh, to issue a mandate that, than it is to create a culture that is truly open to change. People don't like it when you mess with their cultures because it strikes them, on a subconscious level at least, at the heart of who they are. Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Asked the Judeans. Their fears are not about beliefs, but about 
disintegrating walls that they have built around their culture to convince them themselves that they are the holy ones. And this is where Peter explains to them the vision. Two visions, really. One for Peter and one for Cornelius. Peter was praying, he explains, when an enormous sheet from heaven containing all kinds of animals comes down where he's sitting. And I looked closely, he said, and I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, birds of the air. In other words, any almost in a verbatim list of all those unkosher foods that is in Leviticus 11. And as Peter was talking about all of the taking all of this in, God commands him to kill and eat those animals. And Peter refuses. Says nothing unclean has ever touched my lips. And this moment kind of sums up the whole problem. The point of purity is holiness, and the point of holiness is proximity to God. There is a logic to this, and there are rules to this, and the people who followed them, and they had followed them for so long that their culture had become so deeply ingrained in who they were, so strong, in fact, that when God literally shows up and invites Peter to eat some food that he's not supposed to eat, he refuses. I can't think of a better example of the tail wagging the dog than this. Or really, actually the tail wagging the pig. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say. Here we have pigs on a blanket. Who doesn't like those? Oh, in a blanket, that's what the, oh, never mind. But this was a Jewish problem. But it's also a human problem, right? We can't just blame it on them. We prefer rules to a living God. Systems that are consistent in a way that uh, living gods just aren't. God is capricious sometimes, uh, unexplainable, mysterious. God repeats the instructions three times to Peter, a significant and holy repetition in Scripture that emphasizes a deep truth is being spoken here. And after Peter's third refusal, the giant sheet retracts back into heaven, and it's at this precise moment that the visitors show up, arriving to tell Peter that he needs to pay a visit to this man who's had a vision of him. And it turns out that this man is a centurion, a leader in the Roman's army, having had a vision of his own, a vision of an angel telling him to invite Peter over for dinner. And it's interesting to me that uh, it is this invitation and not God's explicit instructions that end up opening Peter's eyes. The Spirit told me to go with them and to not make a distinction between them and us. Peter explains to his friends. And by the time he arrives at Cornelius' house and heard the story, he knew enough to sit at the table and eat the food that the soldiers had prepared. Whether it was clean or unclean, didn't matter. After all, what God has called clean, you shall not call profane, was still echoing in his ears and sinking into his heart. And it's this moment, this moment of hospitality and Paul's, Peter's acceptance uh, of it that triggers an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And everyone in that house is baptized. You know, to me, there's so much to love about this story. Peter imagines himself to be an agent of God's grace and uh, to a certain extent he is. But it may come, be, it may be more accurate to say that uh, he's more just a witness. 
to this outpouring of grace and love on God's part. Peter receives a knock on his own door, inviting him to come and speak to Cornelius. And it's like a reverse Jehovah Witness encounter. He dutifully arrives only to discover that Cornelius has already been praying to God and been praying in his own way for years. And in fact, he's received a very clear message from an angel, a message faithfully heard and followed by Cornelius. And just because Peter's presence is there, he is baptized. But Peter is also converted here. Converted to a larger and more gracious vision of the love of God than he had had before. One might say that Cornelius changes the course of the Christian church forever. His faithfulness broke down walls that imprisoned as much as they had protected. Why was the hospitality of Cornelius able to transform Peter in a way that God's actual voice had not. I have to think it's because culture eats strategy for breakfast. I have to think that because we are transformed by relationships, by stories, by shared meals at shared tables, with dangerous people. That that's the way which gets our walls broken down. I was a senior in college, or going to be a senior in college, in 1978 when our denomination uh, voted what uh, became the rule of the law land in our denomination. A vote that said, this is definitive guidance on who can be a minister and who can't. Who can be an elder in the church and who cannot. And anybody who was an admitted practicing gay person was not allowed. And I had been in the San Diego General Assembly meeting where they voted for that. And I went to seminary that fall thinking that, you know, or actually the next fall, thinking that I needed to be a good leader of the church and follow this guidance. And yet, over and over again, I was confronted by people who were in the closet, whose ministry obviously was ordained and blessed by God because of the way that they treated people. Several had been ordained before this guidance ever came out. Some of them were my classmates. And the pain that this was causing for them was tremendous. And hearing their stories, having them confess to me what was going on in their lives, having them share with me, continue to transform my heart. Because I love these people. I knew that they loved me. And when I moved here, I told people in my other church that this had been a battle that had been going on since before I was ordained. And I really wanted to be in a place where they were talking about it in a meaningful way, that this presbytery that we're a part of had ordained several people who were gay and had supported them and heard their stories and told their stories. And some of them were on the front lines. And at that first Presbyterian meeting I went to, we had communion. It was at Covenant Press in, in, um, in Napa. And as I came forward with communion, <laughs> I felt the Holy Spirit as I received the bread and the cup from this one person who I didn't know for sure, but it moved me. And I walked back to my pew in tears. 
And I think it was Lynn Hamilton that I turned to and I said, who is that? I felt the spirit so powerfully from her. And it was Janie Sparr who has been the leader in our denomination for this no distinction between peoples. This love that was meant to be expressed by all, received by all. And I'm glad that we as a denomination have finally taken a stand and said there is no distinction, that God is going to work in ways that we could never have imagined. Our culture may say it's awful and hard and I don't know how to accept it. I don't know if I can live with it. But God says something else. And God has been saying something else through the psalmist who included sea monsters. Through Peter, who was told to kill and eat things that his culture had told him and told his ancestors for generations they shouldn't eat. And through a Roman centurion, an officer in the Roman army who was persecuting his people, but who had also known and prayed to God and had gotten this message and invited him into his home. So the question is, brothers and sisters, can we walk out of this room and look at each person that we meet as a beloved child of God? Can we look at the trees and the mountains and the skies and the dry earth and the monsters that live in the oceans and the people that we have vilified and said, they're not like us and wrap our arms around them in faith and know that they are God's own no more or no less than we. May it be so. Amen.
Amen. Are there joys and concerns that you'd like to share with each other today? I have one. Okay. Linda, would you mind? Thank you. for prayers for my younger daughter, Terry, who has just been diagnosed with lung cancer. Uh, she recently retired. Uh, I have to think of what she does for a living. It has to do with breathing in the hospital. And so she'll be able to give herself good advice. I hope she takes it. Respiratory tech. That's what she was. Anyway, your prayers. Thank you. Thanks for sharing, Maggie. Anyone else have a tour of concern? A couple towards the back, three towards the back? So Robin's here, you guys. Robin is part of these walls. Her children are part of the walls. I don't know. She was here, Claire and Sarah, when they were tiny, teeny, and, and ran around with my kids. And Anyway, so she still is important. She probably wants to say something, but I love having her back. It's lovely to be here. Thank you. I miss you all, always. And I did tune in quite a bit during COVID. <laughs> Amen. It's great to have you here, Robin. I'd like to ask for prayer for a dear friend of mine, Jerry Simmons, who has been diagnosed with Parkinson's. Thanks, Marilyn. And I uh, ask for prayers for both Marjorie and I as we uh, make a big step on Tuesday. We're uh, headed for a retirement center, and it's new to us. It's a new part of our life, but we need help. We need your prayers, uh, especially as we deal with the movers on Tuesday. <laughs> Excellent. Good morning. I have a joy and I have a concern. First of all, my great joy, I went down to the Bay Area to help my sister. She was to have surgery on the corner of her nose and it was cancerous. And it was to take three hours to, for it to, you know, for the surgery. Well, my brother-in-law brought him to the daughter to the hospital, thinking that we were going to sit there for three hours. 45 minutes, she called and she said, come and get me. I thought, what? It's not three hours yet. And the surgeon couldn't find anything there. He, it was all prepped and ready to go. And, and then he thought, maybe I got the wrong patient. So he looked, and it was my sister, and so he had to call the, another specialist to make sure that, you know, there was nothing there. They couldn't even find a scar. So it was a miracle. And I thought, wow. And anyway, and then the concern is for Daryl Gonder, Linda's husband. He was to have heart surgery, but they found a big clot in his heart, so they couldn't do the surgery until that, you know, was dissolved. So please, prayers for Daryl and also for Linda. She's really, you know, in a pickle. So thank you. Thanks, Irene. Any other joys or concerns this morning? So, yeah, now they're waving. To, they're telling me that I need to make an announcement. So um, I don't know how, how many of you know this, but I think Ed has missed two Sundays since we started taping. Mm -hmm. And... Um, they, between uh, he and Sue, there are nine, no, 11 children, and uh, that means a slew of grandchildren. So every once in a while, now that we're opening up, he has to be gone. <laughs> so in order to continue to uh, uh, do the live streaming and taping uh, and taping, um, we need a few other people to be trained. So if you could, if you're interested in uh, learning how to do this, I know uh, Tom knows how to do it, and Adrian, who is uh, 
has been sick this week uh, and is not here, knows how to do it. But it'd be good to have a, a group that we could uh, put together to train. So it's basically making sure the mics are right and uh, the, the cameras are pointing in the right direction. So if you have any of that kind of interest or, or uh, longing to learn, um, either let Ed or myself know. And uh, the training takes, what, six and a half hours, seven hours? <laughs> Month and a half, yeah, okay. It's really pretty straightforward if you have any technical ability, so. And if you don't, it's still fairly straightforward. All right. Uh, seeing no other prayer requests, let's turn to God in a time of prayer. Holy One, you know, uh, you know us. You know that we like to feel like we're in on something that uh, we're special and <laughs> on some level, we know that we are. We know that we're special in your eyes, but we also know that you have created each one of us in a unique and glorious way. And sometimes it's hard for us to see that. And so you continue to work on our hearts and our minds continue to speak the truth to our cultures, the truth that uh, we often blur because it just levels the playing surface for us. So help us in humility to accept your teaching, to know both deep in our bones that we are special, that we've been gifted by you, that we have a place in this world, but also help us to widen our arms and our hearts and our minds to include those that our culture says no to, to include those that uh, don't are even a part of our culture or have other cultures that we don't understand or uh, struggle with. Help us to see your grace in those places too. Continue to transform us, uh, whether it's uh, looking at somebody from a very different political party or a different skin color or a different ideology. Help us to see that grace which we know you have put in each one of us. Today we come before you with uh, thanksgiving uh, for Robin being with us to visit. We're grateful for uh, the celebration of life together that Ian and Audrey celebrated yesterday and pray that you continue to be with them on their journey. We thank you that Irene's sister is good, that the surgery wasn't required. Hear us as we offer uh, our grateful hearts for the things that we are aware of that are good in our lives. Holy One, we too know that uh, life has its shortcomings and its wounds, brokenness. And we pray for those who are struggling now. We think of Daryl, Linda, as his heart is creating issues. We think of Jerry, who's been diagnosed with Parkinson's. We pray for Lynn and Marjorie as they start this new chapter in their lives and move down Valley. We pray for Terry, Maggie's daughter, who has been through so much in the last year and a half. Hear us as we offer the prayers of our hearts as well for those who we know need your grace today that we didn't speak of. Holy One, continue to speak, continue to transform us from the inside out. 
We pray in Christ's name, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father and Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now in gratitude and praise to God for all God's gifts to us, let us bring our tithes and our offerings. You bless us in so many ways with so many gifts, loving God. As we praise you, we also offer our gifts, receiving the offering of our lives. Draw us and let us disclose to your heart that all creation may be brought from bondage to freedom, from darkness to light, and from death to life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. And please remain standing as we sing the closing hymn.
And now, because life is short, we have so little time to gladden the hearts of those who walk this journey with us. So be generous with your love. Be kinder than is necessary. Never repay anyone evil for evil, but always overcome evil with the good. Seeking to be hospitable, welcoming, loving, gracious, always looking for the grace of God, the spark of life that God has placed in each person that you meet. And may that God of grace who created you in God's own image, that God of love who has redeemed you and set you free to this new life, and that spirit that lives within each of us, that guides us in the way of truth. Go with you now and always. Amen. Amen.